Like I said, I know it's not December yet, but today we're starting a new series uh, for Christmas called The Promised Eternal King. And uh, so the next few weeks will sort of be a one continuous sermon, really, uh, uh, all coming from the same text, Isaiah chapter 9 in the Old Testament uh, prophetic book. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7. And we're really just going to concentrate on a small area of focus in that uh, prophecy that Isaiah gives us of the promised eternal king. And so before we get into that, I want to set you up with some background for those of you who may not be that familiar with Isaiah and the whole situation. So the year is about 735 B.C., 735 years or so before Christ. That's about when Isaiah started his ministry. The king over Judah was Ahaz, and he was facing a dire situation. The Assyrian army was gathering to invade Jerusalem, and he was obviously troubled, and he was seeking alliances and devising uh, strategies to try to defend Judah upon this powerful army that uh, was surely on its way. And so God sent the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz. And in, in a, a kind of a summary, uh, Ahaz says that God told him, to, or uh, Isaiah told Ahaz, God told me to tell you not to worry about alliances. He said, I will protect you. Well, Ahaz was a wicked king who had led uh, Judah and God's people away from him and uh, to worship uh, idols and, and offer sacrifices to Baal and things like that. And so uh, he wasn't really thrilled with God's plan. Uh, I think he, he would rather have an alliance than trust God, if you know what I mean. And so, uh, but Isaiah then assured Ahaz, he said, he basically said, God will send you a miraculous sign to assure his protection if you will trust him. We see that sign, and we're familiar with that passage, which is sort of a pretext to the passage we're going to be looking at. So I want to read it to you, and you'll recognize it. Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah said, Therefore God, the Lord himself, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Common Christmas uh, scripture, right? We're all familiar with Well, that's the background. Isaiah is telling Ahaz, this is a sign from God. There's going to be a young woman give birth. Anyway, but King Ahaz, I'll tell you, I'll get to that in a minute. King Ahaz really didn't want a sign from God. I mean, he's a wicked king. He don't trust God. He didn't want a sign from God because he felt like if God sent him a sign and if God uh, brought him protection, then he would be obligated to obey God. And that's really not what he wanted. He, he liked the way things were going for him on his own, uh, met by his own methods, I guess. But, but God sent him a sign anyway. And uh, when we read this scripture, we see, and you know, and I know probably, we all know that this is a prophecy of the birth of Jesus who would become the Messiah, the promised eternal king that this whole series is focused on. And so when we're thinking about prophecy, I want you to understand something. We're talking about Old Testament prophecy, uh, especially, and maybe all prophecy in general. But when we're looking at Old Testament prophecy or biblical prophecy, one of the things that we need to understand is that almost all of this prophecy includes an immediate fulfillment. Because when a prophet made a proclamation, people needed to see it fulfilled. Uh, uh, sometime immediately, pretty soon anyway. I'm not saying like right then, but within a reasonable amount of time, they wanted to see fulfillment. And, and so all these prophecies, they had an immediate fulfillment, but they also, many of them, or if not all of them, have a latter fulfillment where the prophecy's doubly fulfilled. It's, it's an indicator now, but it's uh, a foreshadowing of something that will come that's even greater later. And that's what we have in this case here. 
Um, sometimes that latter prophecy comes hundreds or even thousands of years later. And so the sign for Ahaz was that some notable child would be born in his day to a young woman. The Hebrew word, don't let, don't let people, um, uh, I guess, uh, or don't be, don't be discouraged if somebody tells you that the Hebrew word here doesn't mean virgin. It means young woman because it can mean young woman and it can mean virgin because a virgin was presumed. But obviously, this young woman, for the immediate fulfillment, wasn't a virgin. But the one to come was. And we know that because of the New Testament story and other scriptures. But we see the fulfillment of this child being born in chapter 8. And you feel free to make a note, go read it, and you can see this child that's born in chapter 8. That's the immediate fulfillment. But the more notable child Isaiah was referring to, mainly the greater fulfillment, would be born later of a virgin. And was obviously this was more than just a normal human birth. And we see that in our text today that we're going to read. And I'll just give you a little hint if you don't already know what it is. This child would be called Wonderful Counselor. That's awesome, isn't it? But he would also be called the Mighty God. That's not a normal child, folks, when, he, when his name is Mighty God. Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. That, that's not, that's, that, that wasn't for the immediate fulfillment. That was for the latter fulfillment of the prophecy. And so th those are not normal descriptions or titles. Those are awesome descriptions or titles that really belong only to God, right? And so we see that in our text today. Uh, let's read it together. It's Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verses 6 and 7. And uh, you ought to have this memorized because over the next several weeks, and I, I don't know how we're going to work next week with hanging in the green, but we, we'll figure something out. But uh, we may just extend this on out. But anyway, we'll be reading this every week. So you're going you're gonna to memorize it, all right, if you don't have it already. Uh, but uh, he, he says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And so... A child is, I'm going to do some explanation here. A child is born and a son is given. And, and I did a sermon on, on this uh, uh, called The King with Four Names a few years ago. I don't remember if I did it here or not. But anyway, but, but uh, this is not going to be a normal child. The government's going to be on his shoulder. He's going to be a great leader, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And notice verse 7. This, this is awesome. He says, of the increase of his government and peace, no end. There's no end. That thus, <laughs> look, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, no end, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform us. That is the reason the title of this series is The Promised Eternal King, because this child that's promised will be a king that reigns and rules forever. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we do just uh, bow before you this morning, and uh, we're so grateful again for the opportunity we have just to open your word, Lord, to hear from you. Speak to us today, Father. Pray that your Holy Spirit reveal, would reveal your truth. Convict our hearts and, and lives and minds of sin. Lord, I pray that we'd all be quick to repent and quick to turn to follow you wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a man went to be treated by a psychiatrist to get some therapy and counseling because he thought he was a mouse. True story. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if it's true or not, but anyway. After several weeks of many counseling sessions, he, he finally was healed, you know, and he learned that, indeed, he, he was not a mouse, okay? And, but, and so as the man walked out of the psychiatrist's office, he saw a cat on the street, and he, he was frightened, and so he ran quickly back into the psychiatrist's office, and he screamed, hey, I'm scared! He said, there's a cat on the street! And the psychiatrist looked at him, and he said, I thought that you now know that you're not a mouse. And he said, I know that, 
But does the cat know that? <laughs> oh, man. Thank God for good counselors, right? And we live in a day and time when many people are encouraged to seek out a good counselor. Uh, you know, when they're experiencing troubling issues in their lives. And I, I refer people to counseling quite often. And Years ago, though, it would have been common for people to keep that fact on the down low. You know, people used to, they didn't want people to know they were going to counseling. You know, uh, because they didn't want people to know that they had problems in their life. But now it's been revealed. Everybody has problems in their life. And at some point, everybody needs some counseling. Am I right? <laughs> and so today, it's really commonplace. And it's often encouraged and people celebrate when people go to see counseling, when they finally go to see a counselor, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. But, but the problem is that counseling alone by human counselors often doesn't quite provide the cure we need. That alone often does not solve our problems. And a lot of times it simply reveals the problem. And sometimes that's really what we need. We need somebody to tell us what's wrong. You know, and, and we need to admit what the problem is. And, and, but I want you to understand something this morning. The cure for your issues comes from one who's not just a counselor, but a wonderful counselor. And that's the title of the message today, Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor. And, and each week, we're going to look at one of these different four names, and we're going to look at these attributes of this king, this promised eternal king. Did you notice these names when we read the, the story? We've already mentioned them several times. The, he'll have four names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. These names represent the character of this promise. When it, they're called names. You know, we give people names just because we like the sound of it today. And we, a lot of times we don't really worry about the meaning of the pe person's name. But, but, you know, in this day, the name meant who the person was or who they would be. And so the, these names represent character, the character of King Jesus, so to speak. So uh, over the next several weeks, we're going to look at these. And the first name given to this promised eternal king is Wonderful Counselor. Now, when you read this, in many translations, they put a comma between the two words, Wonderful and Counselor, just like we have in the New King James Version that we read today. But, but I believe in consistency in the text and with uh, uh, the... the uh, Hebrew language, that, that comma's not necessary. Hebrew language didn't have any punctuation. But when you look at the other words, each one has a modifier and a, a, or a, a, an adjective or a descriptor and a noun. And I think that's what we have here. We have a wonderful counselor. Because we have mighty, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a peaceful prince. Right? And so that's what we have, I believe. And the, the word for wonderful in Hebrew is the word pele, which means beyond understanding. It's, uh, it also can be uh, translated something like beyond description, here or beyond words. Here it, it is translated wonderful. And that's a good translation of it. Just, you know, the word for counselor is the word yalitz. And it, it's, it means one who advises or instructs or guides just like we would expect it to. So Isaiah is basically saying that the promised son would be a counselor that words cannot describe. That's a wonderful counselor. You know, he, he's better than I can really express to you in words. Give me that kind of counselor, right? <laughs> you know, and like I said earlier, almost everyone needs therapy for something. And, uh, you know, uh, you can look around the room or you can look in the mirror. We all need it for something a lot of times, right? And, 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 and most of you know there are counselors who specialize in different areas. There are uh, counselors who specialize in marital counseling or maybe premarital counseling. And, you know, uh, some uh, 
Counselors specialize in addiction, and, and they're specialists with different kinds of addictions and, and things like that. Some specialize in anger management. There's financial counselors, and there's all kinds of counselors uh, for just about anything you can think of. But this counselor, he's a one for all. Uh, he specializes in every area. <laughs> and uh, whatever it is that you're facing, I want you to understand whatever battle it is that rages, you can find the help you need in, with this wonderful counselor. Uh, King Ahaz needed a wonderful counselor because he was about to get uh, thrown down, if you know what I mean. And, and uh, he was seeking these alliances. But the main alliance he needed wasn't of this world because he was a wicked man who was rejecting God. He needed to know this promised king uh, for eternity. He needed to know who it was. He needed to understand uh, what this uh, uh, counselor would bring. And, and this is what Isaiah is trying to tell him. You, you're getting exactly what you need. He's coming. And uh, this wonderful counselor, he knows exactly, he knew exactly what Ahaz needed. And you know what? He knows exactly what you need, too. And I, I, today, I want to share three biblical reasons with you when you're facing a difficult battle that you can look to Jesus as a wonderful counselor. Okay? And this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying it's one sermon. Because today, this is just basically one point of a four-week sermon. All right? But I'm going to share three, three biblical reasons you can look to Jesus as a wonderful counselor. The first one is this. You can look to Jesus as a wonderful counselor because he has experienced your struggles. Jesus knows what it's like to live a difficult life. Did you know that? <laughs> the writer of Hebrews gives us a good reason to turn to this wonderful counselor for whatever it is that you face. And he, he wrote in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. And look what he says. He said, for we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then you, you don't face any kind of temptation, really, that Jesus didn't face, uh, but he knows how to uh, defeat it, right? Now that's the part where most of us have trouble. But he knows how to conquer temptation. He knows how to get through all these things. And then he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. You see, the, this Messiah, this promised king for eternity, this promised eternal king, th he, this Messiah, he, he's not just a king who's going to come and conquer and rule over the world and rule over your life. He's a high priest who has walked where you walk. He, he, he has been down your path. He has worn your shoes. He's eaten, uh, he's struggled with a lot of the things that you've struggled with, and he's experienced temptation just like you. And so when you think about the life of Jesus, and you know, we're coming up on the Christmas season that we're talking about, and even in the Christmas story, we see some of the struggles of Jesus. Jesus was born into poverty, wasn't he? Uh, you think about the way he was brought into this world. Uh, he was born in a manger. Uh, you know, uh, th there was um, no uh, sense of cinnamon and evergreen. It was probably cow dung, you know, and 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 spooling oats or something, you know, uh, ranking. You know what I'm talking about if you've ever been on a farm. He was born in a stable. He was born to poor parents. And, and when he was dedicated at the temple, we see that his parents, Mary and Joseph, when well, they brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him, the, the Bible says that they offered a pigeon for a sacrifice. The requirement was a lamb, but they offered a pigeon. And there was an, a... a, a, a um, there was a provision in the law that allowed the poorest of the poor uh, to offer a pigeon instead of a lamb because they couldn't afford a lamb. And so what does that tell you? It tells you they were poor. They were so poor they couldn't even afford a lamb to sacrifice uh, like most common people would. But, but he, he was the poorest of the poor. He, he was the son of a carpenter. 
and lived a, a simple life for common people growing up, you know. And, and we know that as he entered his ministry, Satan tempted him in the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days. And, and uh, if you don't know this, when you've not eaten food for 40 days, you are hungry, okay? Uh, and Satan tempted him to make bread out of stones, remember? And, and so what Satan was doing was he was trying to tempt him to uh, the physical need to provide for his physical need in a way that, that wasn't necessary. And that's where Satan hits us a lot, isn't it? Our physical needs and our, our physical desires and, and things like that. And so Jesus knew exactly what that was like. And, and Satan also tempted him to use his power to overthrow the governments of the world, to establish his kingdom the easy way. You know, to skip all the suffering and all the ministry and all the suffering and the cross. And let's just not do that. You've got the power. You can just do it your way right now. And, and I suppose in a way he could, but that wasn't God's plan. And so Jesus stuck to the plan, didn't he? He, he, he knew. And, 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 you know, Satan was trying to tempt him into taking the easy way out. And truth be told, we're all guilty of taking the easy road one trip too often, aren't we? And, and, but Jesus said no to that, didn't he? Uh, he, he wanted God's way, whether it was the easiest way or not. And he also knows what it's like to be isolated and lonely. He was often criticized and ridiculed, and he was chased and, and beaten and eventually, you know, uh, crucified and abandoned by nearly everyone in this world he was closest to. And I know you feel that way sometimes. Alone, unloved, abandoned. I think Jesus knows a little about the trouble that we face in life, all of its struggles. And you know, he did that on purpose so he could sympathize with you. He has experienced your struggles. You know, and when you go to a counselor, it's a good a lot of times to go to one. You know, if, if you're struggling with alcohol, a lot of times it's going, it's good to go to a counselor who struggled with alcoholism and found themselves on the top side of that, right? Because they know what it's about. That's why AA uh, is so successful, I think, a lot of times, because they help pair people up who can help one another, people who've been through what they've been through. But Jesus has been through it. He's experienced it. And, uh, Isaiah wrote a little bit more about all that Jesus experienced in chapter 53. He, he, writing about Jesus, he said he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He said, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Jesus knows the struggles of life. He, Jesus knows what it's like to bear the sin of the world. He took that upon himself. <laughs> He's experienced it. You know, when, when I was growing up, my ma lived with us for a few years until she passed away. She was, my ma was my mother's mom. My mom, as many of you know, she was the youngest of eight children, and so her, mom, her mother was born in 1905. And so by the time I came along, she was already getting up in years, and she was a great homemaker and an excellent cook, and she sewed a lot of her own clothes. She even sewed a lot of our clothes. That was fun. But hey, I thought I looked good, you know. But, uh, and she did it on this old pedal-type sewing machine. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You didn't have to plug it in. You were the plug-in, you know? And uh, <laughs> you were the power, right? And um, I also learned how to sew a little bit on that old machine. But uh, one of the things I remember about Ma was, uh, and her sewing was the need she had when she needed to thread a needle. You know, uh, she would, uh, whenever she needed a needle threaded, she had always called one of us children to come and thread the needle for her. And, um, you know, as a child, I really couldn't understand why. I mean, I knew she wore glasses. She couldn't see good and things like that. And, and, uh, but I, I really didn't understand why she had so much trouble putting the thread through the eye of that needle. I mean, I could see it just fine. 
But I want you to know that now I understand. Today, even with corrective lenses, and, and y'all know this, a few years ago my eyes started getting bad. And, uh, uh, since we started this church, I've had to blow up my, my, my type on my iPad so I can see my notes bigger and bigger. Uh, but uh, finally I got some glasses. But, 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 you know, even with corrective lenses, I have trouble trying to get that thread. I, I sew up some stuff. I know some of y'all are amazed by that, but, but I do, do do a little bit of sewing, patching up stuff. And, and, and a lot of times I just keep pushing, you know, and I, I'm guessing. I'll hold it up to the light, and most of the time I can't even see light coming through it, you know. But, but I don't even know if I've got it turned the right way, you know. <laughs> oh, man. But a few weeks ago, I was working, and I was trying to get it, and I finally gave up, and I called on the boys. I think it's Kobe came in there, and he pushed the thread through the needle. I mean, like that, no problem. And I was like, wow. You know? And now, I understand Ma's struggle. Because I'm where she was, I am now am where she was back then. I have walked in her shoes, so to speak. Or you could say I viewed things with her eyes now. And I want you to understand that Jesus has walked in your shoes. There's nothing that you experience that Jesus doesn't understand. He sympathizes with your struggles because he has struggled with those same things too. And since he's the promised eternal king, he's also a wonderful counselor. Who can, and you can turn to him and he can help you because he has experienced your struggles. Another reason you can turn to Jesus as a wonderful counselor is not only has he experienced your struggles, but... You can turn to Jesus as a wonderful counselor because he listens to your squalling. That's right. Some of you may not know what squalling is. Hold on, I'll define it for you. But you know, when, when you're pressed on every side, you feel like you're about to explode, and you feel like you just can't take it anymore, whatever it is, <laughs> you can cry out to this promised eternal king, and he'll listen to your cry. He will listen to you. Um, John gave us this confidence in his first letter. In 1 John chapter 5, he, he says this. He says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You see that? He hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. He knows what we've asked of him. We know what we've asked of him. He listens. He hears. And Numerous, numerous passages of scripture where God hears the cries of people and he answers them. You've heard me make this point before, but he hears us. You can cry out to Jesus. <laughs> Listen, you can cry out. It, don't matter. it don't, doesn't matter where you are in the world. And he'll hear you. When you have a baby in the house... And that baby cries. Everyone hears that cry. Am I right? <laughs> you know, I know some of you are practically dead when you're asleep and you don't hear anything. So, I mean, I, uh, maybe, maybe I'm overqualifying it. And then some of you are deaf pretty much and you can't hear anything anyway. But, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, some, of, some of us have problems, but not Jesus. Jesus don't have any of those problems. He hears your cries. And this morning as I was getting up, I heard little rivers, whimpers, and cries, and seen a light come on. I, I thought, well, I guess it's feeding time. I think I almost always hear him, but, uh, you know, uh, I let Mama take care of it most of the time, right? <laughs> I've not got up in the middle of the night. But, but uh, I think, you know, they say mothers are sort of programmed to hear a baby's cry. And... Um, I think they've actually done some studies on that. that that's got to be true because Christy, normal ways, can sleep through a nuclear blast. And I'm a little, I'm a little jealous of that because I can hear a mouse whisper. All right? But uh, when, there, when the baby was in the house and we had babies, she heard everything. And I always knew it was my turn. 
No, she reminded me. But she, she, she could hear that, and so it's got to be true. You know, uh, when a baby's in the house, a little whimper always seems to wake her up. And I want you to understand, Jesus is like that. He is sensitive to your cries. He doesn't tune you out. When you cry, when you're hurting, he loves you. He cares about you, and he is ready to hear from you. Let Jesus know about your troubles, even... even our Hebrews passage that we shared with the first point tells us to go to him. In verse 16, he says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because he's experienced all the struggles we've experienced. So we can go to him because he will hear us. He will listen and he will give us grace and help in the time of need. It's one thing to hear a baby cry, but it's another to listen to someone squalling. You know, I've had people come to me and I've went to people the same way, so I'm not, I'm not bashing anybody because I can cry with the best of them. Most of you know that. But, but I've had people come to me so broken that they start crying, tears pouring out their eyes, and, and they start sharing their troubles with me. And all I can hear a lot of times is just gurgling and babbling. I mean, they're so broken and crying, I can't understand a word they're saying. I call that squalling. It's a little different than crying, you know. It, it's a little more intense, you know. And they're, they're crying so hard, I just can't understand it. And, and uh, multiple times I've had to say, okay, slow down, take a deep breath, and try to speak where I can understand you because I, I don't know what's going on here. And I don't know how to help you if I, if I, if I can't understand you, you know. And, and, and so, but I want you to understand, Jesus will listen to your squalling. And he understands everything you're saying. You don't have to slow down for him. You don't have to quiet down for him. He's got it. He speaks that language. You can come to him boldly and find the help you need when you need it. He will hear you and he'll listen and he'll help you. Jesus listens sympathetically because there's no suffering, pain, or confusion that you go through that he's not gone through himself, and he can guide you through whatever it is you're struggling with. You can turn to the promised eternal king with your problems because he's a wonderful counselor. He's experienced your struggles, and he will listen to your squalling. And another reason you, can, you should turn to him as your wonderful counselor is because he will never leave your side. He'll never leave your side. <laughs> you know, some of the people you love the most in this world and you think love you the most, sometimes they'll walk away. <laughs> but Jesus will never walk away. He will always be with you when you're his. He never leaves your side. Most counselors give you an appointment. You know, you, you show up during that allotted time. You know, Tuesday at 6 o'clock, you know. In my office, you get 30 minutes or an hour for a session. and Most of the time, towards the end of the session, the counselor will say something like, we've got about five minutes left. You know? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, our wonderful counselor, he's got an open door policy. You can come to him anytime. And uh, his session's never over. He's always on the clock. And he's always available because he's always with you. He's always with you. As Matthew closed out his gospel, he, he gives us this account of the great commission to his followers. Read it with me and pay attention to, to the last part. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I, all things that I've commanded you. And he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You see that? One of my friends said that's why he wouldn't fly on an airplane. Because Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always. Yeah, I think he missed it a little bit. But anyway... He's always with you. 
He's always with you. See that? He promised those that he sends out to do his work that he would always be with them even to the consummation of the present age. When all things are done, he's going to be there. That's, that's the ultimate assurance, isn't it? Just knowing he's with you. Sometimes you just need to have somebody with you. Some, you know, some people can't do anything unless somebody's with them. There's a lot of people that can do anything as long as somebody's with them. You know, uh, you know and God has called us to do his work and, and all that he's called you to do and, and everything he allows you to go through, he promises you that you'll never be alone in, with any of that. The, the Holy Spirit's always with us. One word, the, the Greek word for Holy Spirit, one of the words describing him is parakletos. And that word basically means to come along beside. To come along beside. It. And that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit does, isn't it? He comes alongside of us. He really comes in us. And, but he, he comes along, alongside us. He's always with us. He never leaves us. And we can be comforted in knowing that we're, when we're being persecuted for telling somebody about Jesus or when we're being abused by a husband, or a wife maybe, or, or maybe being beaten by a parent, or uh, when, when you're abandoned, or when you're fired, Jesus is with you. When you're treated unfairly, Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit's there. He's there. He's with you. And so those things can be rough. But know that in all those experiences, He's with you. Jesus was beaten too. He knows what it's like. And he's with you. And you can cry out to him. And he'll hear you. We're never alone. We're never alone. He's always with us. And I, I've, I've told this before. and Many of you have heard it. But some of you have not. But I just love the way it illustrates this point. The, the early American Indians had a unique practice of, of training young braves. And um, what they would do is on the night of the young brave's 13th birthday, they would, after they had spent years teaching them how to hunt and scout and fish and all those things, they would take the young man out into the forests uh, to spend the entire night alone. And uh, until then, he'd never been away from the security of his family and the tribe. But what they would do is they would blindfold him and lead him out into the forest several miles away from home and they would all supposedly scatter off and he would take off the blindfold and he was, when he did, he was in the middle of the thick woods and pitch black and often terrified. If you've ever been in the woods in the dark, you can hear all kinds of noises that you can't hear when it's daylight. You know, every time a twig snaps or something like that, he would vis visualize a wild animal, you know, ready to pounce on him, I'm sure, and and after what seemed like an eternity, finally when dawn starts breaking and those first rays of light start coming through the, the uh, canopy of the forest, he started looking around. He could see flowers, you know, he could make out the trees and, and the outline of the path that they had walked in on. And, and then finally, to his utter astonishment, as he looked around, he could see the figure of a man standing just a few feet away, armed with bow and arrow, his father. He'd been there all night watching over him. So a lot of times when it seems like you're alone, when you're one of his, <laughs> you're never alone. You're never alone. You have a wonderful counselor who's always with you, always watching out for you, protecting you, correcting you, and guiding you. You have nothing to, to fear, and, and you can have confidence in the promised eternal king because he's your wonderful counselor. With him, you're never alone. Jesus and his power are always with you. <laughs> That's comforting, isn't it? And so when you're struggling and afraid and confused, you can be assured that you have a wonderful counselor in Jesus who's experienced your struggles, who will listen to your squalling, and will never leave your side. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He's the promised eternal king. And 
So this morning, the, the invitation is simple. Will you come to the wonderful counselor with your problems? Look, you know you got them. I know you got them. Everybody knows you got them. Take them to Jesus. Come to him. I don't tell you, when you come to Jesus, be honest with him. And a lot of times when people go to counselors, and, and I hear this from counselors a lot of times, and I've experienced it some, you know, especially with husbands and wives, nobody's telling the whole story, you know. Nobody's being completely truthful, at least not at first. Be honest with Jesus, because you know what? He, he already knows anyway. Just go to him and be completely honest with him and just admit to him when you come to him. And, and when you come to Jesus, you've got to want the change that he's going to bring. Don't go to him and try to make him do things your way. Go to him and let him do things his way. Because that's what you need. That's what we all need. Admitting your problems without wanting him to help you change them in his way, will re it'll just result in disappointment for you. And when you come to Jesus, do whatever he says. <laughs> you know, I give advice to a lot of people who are struggling. And, and most of the time, the people that I ask to do a few different things, they never do all the things that I ask them to do. And so they never get out of the situation that they came to me about in the first place. Because they won't do what I, what I think they need to do. And I'm trying to tell them what I think Jesus is telling them to do. But, but I'm just telling you, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Yeah. It's like when Jesus changed the water into wine, you know, his mother mother told everybody, said, just do whatever he says. That's what I'm telling you. Do whatever he says and you will see a miracle. You will. And so I want to ask you this morning, will you come to the wonderful counselor? He can solve your problems. Are you weighted down with a load of guilt? He can bear that burden. He can lighten that load. Maybe it's a broken marriage. He, he, can, he can heal that. He can fix that. Maybe it's a wandering child that you're worried about. He can show them the way. He can put them on the right path. Maybe, maybe it's health that you're dealing with, health problems. He can heal you. you. You know that. He can bring healing and he can bring grace in that time of need, but Maybe it's sin. It's always sin. He's got that too. The Bible says if we confess our sins to him, that he will hear us and he will forgive us and cleanse us. Confess your sin to Jesus. He's already done everything that needs to be done to free you from the guilt and shame of sin. Come to Jesus. When you come to him, today is the day for you to get counseling. From the wonderful counselor, we come to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you today. Lord, we're thankful that you are a wonderful counselor. And God, that you are the promised eternal king that one day will set all things right. And on that day, there will be no more need for counseling. There will be no more war. Lord, there will only be peace. And oh, Lord, how we look forward to that. Give that to hearts and lives here today, to people who need to confess sin and come to you in faith. Will you do that right now, Jesus? Draw people to you in Jesus' name and set them free. Amen. So let's.